Hey, okay. Well, thank you. This is the first time I've ever actually been asked to open an arcade. Cool. Cool. I'm sure the pizza is better than we had pizza time here. So, uh, let me tell you some stories. Ask me to talk about how Pong came about in the first video games. This is way back when, before most of you were born. 1972. I grew up in San Francisco. Went to high school here, grew up uh, right near the corner of Haight-Ashbury. And uh, uh, the existing games at that time, well, let me say I, I was an engineer. Always wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I liked that stuff. And no, I liked pinball machines, but I never thought that would be a career or anything. I wanted to do video. And I wound up. <laughs> wound up So I wound up at the uh, University of California, this is during the Vietnam War, so it's kind of important because it was either the choice then was to go to college or go to Vietnam, and uh, the odds were better at Cal. I actually played football. What's that? Oh, you do that too, that's unique. <laughs> All right, so I played football and actually got into uh, Cal because I played football, played there for one week and quit. I decided I'd either be a football player or an engineer, and my odds were better as an engineer. And then there was the 60s, and if you look in uh, People's Park, if anybody knows about that, and all the reading, writing, revolution stuff, uh, I was in the middle of all that to actually get some pictures that are uh, artistic, and were in some uh, books and looking at the uh, conflict that was going on there. So it was a very interesting time where our par my parents, our parents, he had gone through the depression and was really lucky to be in, a, in, in, in going to college. Eventually, you're going to get a good job and stuff. But of course, to me, then it also meant I wasn't going to go to Vietnam, which is very important. Uh, and uh, my father, by the way, was uh, was a merchant marine and he was shipping napalm and stuff to Vietnam. And uh, so we had some interesting discussions. Uh, so I got a job. I decided to do work study, and I wound up getting a job at Ampex, which at the time the company just about doesn't exist anymore but it had invented videotape recording. And some of the finest engineers in the world were there, and I actually worked uh, work study. So I was working six months at Ampex around some really good engineers. And I also, uh, I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, growing up, I hate Ashbury. My neighbor had a TV repair shop, so I fixed televisions. I learned how to fix televisions, which came in real handy because I was able to pay my way through school fixing TVs. But it also allowed me to know how TVs really work. That was important. So, um, let me see here. Uh, yeah, so, so, at a, so at Ampex, I was there just a couple of years and it got ugly. All of a sudden they had a financial problem. Now meanwhile, Nolan Bushnell was another engineer at Ampex and he had, he was very entrepreneurial. He wasn't a very good engineer, but he was very entrepreneurial and, and, and he came from Utah uh, graduated last in his class at the University of Utah, but University of Utah had a PDP-1 computer and actually was one of the first places, courtesy of Ivan Sutherland, to do computer graphics. They had the Space War game, the early Space War game, which played only on a PDP-1 computer, and that's not what a PDP-1 computer was made for, but every PDP-1 computer in the world, there were maybe 100 of them, was playing Space War, so that, that came up. And he also worked at an arcade in Salt Lake City, a big arcade in the summer, running the pinball machine. So he understood the business of coin operating entertainment. He says, hey, there's some play value in that game, but the PDP-1 computer in those days was about, you know, today, $100,000, something like that. So there was no way you could put it in the box and put quarters in it. Uh, by the way, there at the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View, which is just now opening up to the public, they actually have a PDP-1 and they got it playing computers or Space War. So that if you want to see that, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's very impressive, a lot of fun. So, so uh, Nolan uh, left, started this company, or he worked for a company called Nutting Associates uh, that was the only coin operator company in California, I rock, luckily enough, and, they, and he did this game called Computer Space, which is very much like Space War. But Space War really appealed to people who knew physics and, and dynamics and stuff, and so it didn't play, it didn't do very well. They sold a few hundred machines, but it, that was truly the first coin-operated arcade video game. He then went off and decided to start his own company called Syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, 
It's a great word in the hangman. It's a real word. It's the last S in the dictionary. Soon we found we couldn't use that name, so our second choice was Atari. And, uh, and, and Nolan gave me this project. Uh, he told me he had a contract from General Electric to do a home game uh, that, that was a very, very simple game. One spot uh, and a net and uh, paddles and score digits. And he told me he had a contract from General Electric to do this. And I was 24 years old and I didn't know. And the fact that nobody from General Electric ever came by, uh, you know, didn't bother me. Turns out what he was doing was giving me the very simplest thing he could think of to get me up to speed because I, the only person that had ever done a video game was Steve Russell on Space War and Nolan with Computer Space. So I had to learn the ropes and to, let's do the easiest game and then throw it away, right? And then get out. I think the game he wanted to do was a driving game of some kind, much more complex. But he didn't tell me that. So I'm working on Pong. I'm not two months into this thing with parts I had left over from Ampex, just all TTL parts. There were no microprocessors, there's no computer program, no code. It's just a machine that plays Pong. And I added the speed up, and I added the sound, and these things to make it playable. Um, um, and no one said, that's pretty good. And it's got to have sound. And I said, okay, what kind of sound do you want? It's got to have the roar of a crowd of thousands. Uh, I said, I don't want to do that. I have <laughs> parts already. So I just poked around for tones that were already there existing in the circuit. And those were the sounds on Pong, and I said, if you don't like them, Nolan, you're changing yourself. He couldn't do it, so that, that's how they, that, how, that's how that stuck. At that point, it was about three months, and we had this prototype in a box. We made a box over the weekend. I'll show you a picture of it here. Let's see. Yeah, let me, let me also, before I go into the picture, let me tell you a little bit more about some of the concepts, because the idea, one of the things we used was a, was a TV set, a modified black and white TV. Back in those days, uh, Motorola and a few companies, uh, Starks Tarzan, made monitors. These are green phosphor, monochrome monitors. They were in airports. I remember at SFO, and half of them never worked, and they cost $500 a piece. So because I knew TVs real well and could fix them, I went down to Walgreens, bought a TV set, converted it into a monitor, it cost 75 bucks. So that was the tea, but it had a volume control in it too, it did sound, and uh, it was real cheap. So we put that in the box, and that, that's, that was the, uh, one of the criteria. The other, and so we made the video using digital. Now, video, electronic video signal is an analog signal, and I knew that from Ampex, because they make beautiful video, but I did it all with TTL uh, digital parts. So it was kind of a, a bastardized thing, and the sync signals weren't right, they were wrong, but it worked. And, and so I got criticized by experts that it was sloppy, but it was cheap, real cheap. So that's how we did it. And, and then he said, no one said any game has to be easy to learn and uh, difficult to master. Okay, so, yeah, so I've already gone through that. Oh yeah, there are tremendous cost constraints to do this. this was, this had to be just the minimal amounts of parts, and as a consumer game, it would need about 10 chips, 10 little TTL chips, and the thing with that. The thing actually had about 75, and so I was kind of a failure in that regard. But Nolan all of a sudden turned around and said, you know, maybe there's some play value in this game. And oh, by the way, we were so underfunded, we had like $500 in capital to start this company, says so you Atari. But we had from earnings from the computer space royalties, no one bought, uh, invested them in pinball machines and driving games, and we had a route, about 50 machines out there, and that cash flow gave us, gave us cash flow, we could, we could live in either. The banks wouldn't give us any money. There were no venture capitalists at the time to speak of. So, so all of a sudden, uh, we said, well, let's put it in the box and put it in one of our locations, one of our best locations, Andy Cap Tavern, and see what happens, you know, what could, what could go wrong? So. This crude prototype went in the box, and we put it in a cap. Let me see. Oh yeah, here we go. There it is. Um, I can't see too much. Now that is that is the original prototype, uh, which is now at the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View. There's a coin box here from like a laundromat. Just pulled it on the side of here, and there's two knobs. 
They used to say player one and player two, but they rubbed off because we just press on letters. And there are no instructions. <laughs> and I'm thinking, now let me get the, put it on a barrel in this, in this, uh, in this bar next to a pinball machine. And, 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 and the only video game, the only game ever that requires two people. There's no one player. You have to have two people to play. And again, no instructions. So, I mean, how good is this going to be? <laughs> well, it turned out to be, uh, do quite well. Uh, um, in fact, you can, you can see the back here. Here's the TV. Uh, there's a nice stick holding it in from falling out. Uh, and there's a chassis, a metal chassis in here. If you look very carefully, there's just a rat's nest of wires. I'm pretty sloppy at doing this stuff. And it was just evolved, and I kind of added more ICs as I needed them. And so it was pretty much unplanned. And, and, and the fact that it worked at all, I was pretty impressed, even though it worked, because it was so flaky. So, uh, 